It's my pleasure to meet you. I must say as the Hebrew translator of Harry Potter, uh, there are many people who assume I know all about the Yiddish translation and that I was somehow connected to it. So I had absolutely no connection and no knowledge of what was happening with the Yiddish translation, but I got all the links sent to me over and over and over again and asked if I know Arun over and over and over again. And it's my pleasure and privilege to finally meet you uh, digitally, if sort of in person. <laughs> it's my pleasure as well. And I'm really, really excited for this uh, conversation. And I must say that uh, oftentimes I will get people asking me why you did something a certain way, or, you know, you did this change. Why didn't, why didn't I do it? Um, and so I've, you know, had the opportunity to engage with uh, your translation indirectly in many, many ways as well. Uh, but I understand that you didn't actually, that you purposefully did not consult my translation when you were working on yours, that you didn't want to mix up uh, what you were doing with what I had done. Yeah, well, when I was, uh, how old could I have been when when it first came out, like 12 or 13, I was like, I'm going to read Harry Potter in Hebrew. Uh, and I, you know, I have it here. Uh along with uh, a whole bunch of other languages. And I thought I was going to, and then I opened the first page and I was like, huh, my Hebrew is not as good as I thought. And then when I finally felt like my Hebrew was good enough, I was already working on the Yiddish. And um, of course I, I didn't want to get distracted or, or, or confused by other translations. And now of course I can't open up a Harry Potter book without starting to translate in my head. So I, I, I'm not sure if it's ever going to happen, but uh, I, I hope, I hope that it will. <laughs> this is very, very familiar. I can't, I can't reopen the Hebrew without wanting to edit myself and correct all sorts of things and update them and do them better. Uh, so I try not to open them anymore. <laughs> but yes, but, but occasionally someone will ask me, how did you translate so and so? And I have no recollection and I have to go back to the books to check them. Because it for me, it's been it's been uh, over 20 years since I started translating. Uh, and you, you translated, I understand that you read the books as a child, uh, and you already sort of, that, I think that's how they were meant to be read. They were meant to be read by children and to grow up with them. And for me, it was a completely different kind of reading experience. Well, what was kind of amazing was, uh, okay, if you look at like the actual universe, the timeline starts in 1980, but if you look, go based on when the book started to come out, I kind of uh, was the same age as Harry throughout the entire series. And so I think um, everybody in my generation uh, kind of feels like they grew, they really grew up together with Harry Potter. And so it holds a very special place uh, in many of our hearts. So you grew up in New Jersey. Yes. I did. I grew up in the suburbs. Nothing too interesting. <laughs> well, I think you're very interesting, actually. Uh, uh, we heard that uh, we heard two languages that were spoken at home, uh, Yiddish and Tamil, but I'm sure you spoke English as well. Uh, at yeah, home. Yeah. We brought home English during playdates, I guess, and from school. But there was other than that, there was no English at home. So we were spoken to and we were expected to respond uh, in Tamil to my father and Yiddish to my mother. Uh, do you do, I'm, I'm just curious, do you do mash, mashups of the two languages? Do you do code switching? Uh, um, I, yeah, um, occasionally we do. We really enjoy coming up with uh, multilingual puns. Uh, you know, for example, like moil in, in Yiddish, well, in addition to meaning uh, uh, a mohel, uh, also means mouth. Uh, and, um and in Tamil, it means a rabbit. So we always enjoyed finding these funny little connections uh, and, and playing with them. So I, I guess from a very early age, I've, I've enjoyed playing with language in that sense. And uh, what was your primary language for reading when you were growing up? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, definitely English. Um, and this was something that really bothered me. Um, my parents both really wanted us to grow up with a sense of pride and and uh, and facility with the languages that they spoke to us in. Um, with Tamil, it was hard for reasons we won't get into. Um, and for Yiddish, it was challenging also because even though there was a burgeoning um, and really kind of sophisticated uh, children's literature developing in the in the pre-war period, um, 
that stuff didn't really speak to me. It was written for a different generation. Um, and while there is a ton of Yiddish literature coming out of the Hasidic world, um, that also it felt like a world apart in many ways. Um, and also, um, well, I guess, you know, the, the, the themes uh, and the subject matter that uh, Hasidic children's literature dealt with was, uh, I felt a little bit limited and, and perhaps moralistic in, in a way that is totally consistent with what you'd expect. Um, and so I really felt like, where is my, where, where is like my Yiddish children's literature that's like Goosebumps or that's like Animorphs uh, or Harry Potter? Right. So who were the imagined readers that you were translating for when you translated into Yiddish? Yeah, well, the, the, the funny part of the story is that I didn't really uh, consider undertaking this translation until my wife said, hey, if we're thinking about having kids, um, you do know that there's no Harry Potter in Yiddish, and that's a really big problem, right? So she's actually the big Harry Potter fan. Um, and uh, so I guess in the most uh, in the most narrow sense, it was for my for my my daughter who is now born, and uh, hopefully for future children as well, and for the kids of all of my friends who grew up, my Yiddishist uh, friends, namely people who speak Yiddish or engage with Yiddish outside of the Hasidic world and who uh, also want this uh, this thing for their kids and for themselves too. Um, one of the things about the Yiddishist community is that we're always looking for ways to engage creatively with Yiddish and to experience Yiddish in new ways. Um, so, you know, many Yiddishists, of course, love classic Yiddish literature, but uh, there's also, you know, you have to be able to engage with something in the here and the now. Um, and so I definitely felt like that was the most immediate opportunity, but I also knew that, uh, you know, Yiddish as the historic vernacular of, uh, of Eastern European Ashkenazi Jews, um, and as the continued vernacular of Hasidim today, it would also resonate um, in different ways, perhaps, uh, with different uh, segments. But You are talking about a, a, a Yiddish community. You do have sort of a group that you're, that you're thinking of and... I mean, for me, one of the things that guides me when I'm making certain decisions in translation is answering the question, who is going to be reading this and why and where? Um, and my answer doesn't always match reality later. And <laughs> for instance, I was translating the Harry Potter books for children who do not read English. And over the years, it turned out that, in fact, a lot of adults were reading them, and a lot of people who had already read them in English were reading them in order to uh, see how I had dealt with translation issues or see how their understanding was different if they read it in a different language. Um, and I imagine, were, were you surprised by some of the people who, who read the book? That's a that's a great point. So you say that there are some people who read it for the first time um, in Hebrew. Um, my expectation was that anybody who read Harry Potter um, in Yiddish would already have read it in English. And so I was less, I mean, obviously you have to, there, there's a certain integrity to the translation that you have to maintain, but um, I was not as concerned with uh, presenting this for the first time to people. Um, and I knew, of course, that people would be scrutinizing my translation as, as I know they did yours. Um, and so I guess what I was, there were a couple of things that surprised me. Um, one was that there were actually quite a few people from the Hasidic community um, who did buy it. Um, and that was surprising to me because I always had imagined I, I had this kind of pretty unnuanced view of, you know, there is the Hasidic world, they're kind of behind these walls, um, and then there's the rest of the Jewish world. And it turns out that uh, that's greatly exaggerated and the, uh, the, the borders of the community are much more porous and, uh, and more on a gradient than we might imagine. So that was the first thing that surprised me. The second thing that surprised me was that most of these Hasidic parents um, were buying it for their kids who had already read it in English. Um, and so that was that was the thing that was particularly surprising to me. And oftentimes when people come to me and say, you know, if you're translating Harry Potter into Yiddish, shouldn't you be doing it into the modern Hasidic variety? 
And my response is always twofold. First of all, I, I don't speak to the Hasidic Friday. That's that's not what I'm familiar with. But also, and this kind of speaks to your question, my the the intended audience is not people is not to make Harry Potter accessible for the first time. Although I know that uh, there are some stubborn Yiddishists who refuse to read it until it existed in Yiddish. Um, so yes, I, I've been surprised by that. I read also though that you played with different Yiddish dialects with the different characters. That was one of your way of solving the, the dialects in, in English. So how, how, how do you know different Yiddish dialects? How, how is this uh, accessible to you? Yes. Um, I mean, I grew up speaking Yiddish um, and I, from a very young age, I knew that there were many different Yiddish dialects. Um, first of all, because I speak uh, the Ukrainian dialect of Yiddish and many Yiddishists uh, tend to speak um, something that's based on Litvish Yiddish, which is a Northeastern dialect. Um, and I also had, uh, we had close family friends who spoke the Polish dialect, and those were kind of the three main dialects uh, before the war. Um, and so I, I knew that there, that dialects existed. And my grandfather also, uh, it was interesting looking at your bio, I was like, there's a lot of interesting parallels here. Um, my grandfather was a, was a professor of Yiddish and a Yiddishist and a, a Yiddish educator. Um, and one of the things that he really uh, tried to, to do was to preserve the, the uniqueness of different dialects. Um, so I did have to do a lot of research, um, try to find reference works and also just literary works that are that are um, that have characters that speak certain dialects. Um, but to kind of just go back to why I, why I did it at all. Um, we, of course, have Hagrid um, in the original who is speaking some sort of West Country dialect. Um, and you can see that he's speaking dialect because of all these apostrophes. Um, and so I knew that I had to do something for him. Uh, and Hagrid, of course, uh, in terms of his personality, he's warm, he's kind of bumbling and fumbling, and uh, he has a big beard. And so I thought, okay, if we're going with complete caricatures and stereotypes, I feel like Hagrid is a Galicianer. Uh, Galicianer meaning somebody who uh, spoke the, the Galicianer, a Polish dialect of Yiddish, someone who says a shine meidel, not a shane meidel. Um, and so I felt like that matched up perfectly, but if I was going to do a Galiciano, I couldn't not do a Litvak. Um, and so I, I picked some, uh, arch, arch enemies, uh, or, you know, people who really contrasted Hagrid, uh, to represent the Litvish dialect. Um, people like, well, yeah, who hates Hagrid? Um, Filch. Dolores Umbridge. I had a whole thing with Ooh. making her language different than his and yeah. I That's need to think, well, I have, I have a while before I think about Umbridge. That's um, right. That's right. Yes. I, I had McGonagall and Snape who really don't approve of, you know, various kinds of tomfoolery kind of tight buttoned up. Um, and I had them speaking that dialect. And the funny thing is that um, by, by kind of transposing the, the world of Harry Potter onto the world of the Shtetl, or maybe the other way around, um, the, the irony is that for many, uh, modern Jewish readers, even Yiddishists, uh, the world of Harry Potter, which is uh, for most of them, and they're not British for the most part, uh, the world of Harry Potter is more familiar to them than the world of the shtetl. Um, so there is a very interesting reversal uh, where it's like, what is being transposed onto what and what is making what more, more accessible? So in many ways, I feel like Harry Potter created a way to make Yiddish dialects more accessible um, for Yiddish students and for generally people who appreciate um, different dialects of Yiddish. I'm now thinking ahead to uh, later books in the series uh, where you might even find that Yiddish works particularly well because you're seeing the wizards <laughs> as being a minority trying to fit in uh, in a society that doesn't isn't aware of their uh, traditions and, uh, and and sort of being both outsiders and insiders at the same time, and that might work particularly well in Yiddish. So here's here's another question, a general question: Is everything funnier in Yiddish? Mm, the million dollar question. Um, so I think what I would say is that Yiddish certainly has the capacity to be funny, perhaps even uniquely funny. Um, and I mean, anybody who comes from an Ashkenazi ancestry uh, probably has access to uh, some of these like really poignant um, 
and often humorous things that have been passed along in their family. Um, but given that um, Yiddish was also the default, it was the default language, the vernacular of, of Jews, in, Jews in Eastern Europe, and um, not all of life is funny. In fact, arguably, most of life is not funny. Um, Yiddish also has the ability to sort of be emotionally neutral. But again, it's there are a lot of opportunities to inject irony in ways that I feel map very well onto, um, well, I guess for the most part, Harry, Harry is kind of the narrator. Um, I, I feel like it maps very well onto his self-conscious, ironic point of view. Um, so yes. Did, I did you like ever feel like the language was, was drawing you to make certain choices? Like, because it was Yiddish, uh, you wanted to translate a certain way and not some other way. Yeah, I, I would say there are, there are two examples. One is uh, sort of uh, a case of the, the word is made up in, in, from Harry Potter, and so I need to make something up, but I need to make it uniquely Yiddish. Um, and the other is just related to the normal speech. So I'll, I'll start with the last one. Um, Something that I, I think all Hebrew speak, speakers would be familiar with is um, when you're talking about something that, God forbid, you don't want it to happen, you'll say chalila. Um, and in Yiddish, you say cholila. Um, so when Hermione, for example, is saying, oh, we can't do that, you know, we might get kicked out of school, um, she says, and so th there are sort of these ways in which you can, you can take out all of the religious feeling elements, but if you take too much out, it almost starts to just feel like you're, you're, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have the personality of Yiddish and it needs to read like Yiddish, even as it reads like Harry Potter. Um, the other example that I would say, which is a, maybe a little bit more uh, creative one, and uh, some people have told me that I, you know, you really didn't have to do that. It, the original was fine. Um, is the name of Quidditch? I see your your sign and shaking your head. Some everybody will. You know, everybody's a critic. Everybody has their own idea of what you should and should not do in translation, and there there's no correct answer. So I'll I'm <laughs> pleased to hear your solution. Sometimes something is just begging to be done, and you almost feel like the exactly. proverbial the proverbial sculptor where you it's something's just coming out of the out of the stone. Um, so. Uh, this particular example is uh, is that of Quidditch. Um, and you could argue that Quidditch basically already sounds like Yiddish words. So just call it Quidditch, why not? Um, but- With, with an ayin. With, with an ayin before the, 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 yeah, I'm saying, I'm in, picturing it in my head, how, how I write it. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, and I originally had that as the translation. And then I remembered that there's this very famous saying in Yiddish, which, I don't know if it's still current in Hebrew. Um, the Hebrew saying is, which in Yiddish is, which literally means, if God wills it, even a broom can shoot, or, or perhaps, well, let's just say, perhaps uh, even a broom can shoot. Um, and I thought, that feels a little bit too perfect, right? We're talking about people flying around on brooms, shooting things into hoops. Um, I have to figure out some way to take this and compress it into the name of, of Quiddish. And so, Shisen is to shoot, and Basim is uh, is a broom, and so Shis Basim became uh, became the word for Quidditch. And if actually, if you look in the Scots translation, he translates Quidditch as uh, Bismba, and so he uses a word from this with the same etymological root Bism as Shis Basim. So that was something where I really felt like the the language was drawing me towards that, not in terms of its like syntactic structure, but in terms of its cultural tradition. Perfect. And I had moments like that as well. Uh, there, were, there were things that just suggested themselves and I, I couldn't resist. So as soon as I knew uh, what Thestrals, the, the nature of Thestrals and how, you know, they're related to death. These are flying horses. The first time I came across the expression was in uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And all it said was that they're a type of flying horse. But later we find out that they're related to death, that they're skeletal, that they're connected to bad luck. And then I just had to call them Pegasus, horse Ooh. of harm, which oh, is all that's amazing on Pegasus. That uh, is fantastic. <laughs> 
or or the Wisengamot, which became Samhedri, uh, which also it just suggested itself out of the language. But uh, but as we said, people are very critical, and I saw a big generational gap between uh, older generations who felt that I had not Hebraified enough, that I had left much too much loazit, I, much too much just, you know, transcribing into Hebrew uh, the English terms, and younger generations that thought quite the opposite, that I had done way too much Hebraifying and I should have left it, and I should have had how dared I translate death eaters to ochlei mavet and not write death eaters. And so, you know, expectations uh, of what translation is supposed to do uh, fuel these statements about whether your translation was went too far or was, you know, correct. And uh, the expectations aren't uniform. They're not uniform. Uh, I would like to hear a little bit of your translation. Could you possibly read us the Sorting Hat song from, from the book? It would be my pleasure. And I also see that um, somebody in the chat is writing, you hope to see an audiobook of Harry Potter someday. I'm just dropping a link into the chat that hopefully everybody can access. It is, unfortunately, it's me uh doing doing chapter one uh and you'll actually hear a lot of the yiddish dialects in there um hopefully we'll get a professional voice actor to do the to do the whole audiobook but for now you'll you'll have to uh be satisfied with me so okay without further ado i'm just going to share my screen um and what i'm going to do is <coughs> read each stanza um first in english and then in yiddish cornelia don't uh, worry, I'm sharing my screen, so you will be able to read along um, both the English and the Yiddish, um, and then perhaps Gilly will grace us with uh, with her translation as well. All righty. Um, I guess I should quickly explain what the Sorting Hat song is uh, for anybody who doesn't know. Um, upon matriculation at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, uh, you are instructed to put on a uh, hat which looks into your mind and decides which of the four residential houses you will be in, uh, Gryffindor, Slytherin, Ravenclaw, or Hufflepuff. Um, I think that I uh, had to do unique translations for each of these in Yiddish. Yes, so uh, Gryffindor is Golden Griff, um, Slytherin is Samderin, Ravenclaw is Robbenkrell, and Hufflepuff is Hufflepuff, because that's that just sounds like a Yiddish word. All righty, here we go. <clears throat> oh, you may not think I'm pretty, but don't judge on what you see. I'll eat myself if you can find a smarter hat than me. You can keep your bowlers black, your top hats sleek and tall. For I'm the Hogwarts sorting hat, and I can cap them all. Hey, die Kepke, Kitschme, Kapelich, die Streimelois gepitzte, Zeitsche Meuchel, ich bin das der Same Kimtsinitzte. There's nothing hidden in your head the sorting hat can't see. So try me on, and I will tell you where you ought to be. Der Hogwartse sortiert hit, weist dann etzem in dann Kern, to mest machun, in Herme Venus, vem de tist geherm. You might belong in Gryffindor, where dwell the brave at heart. Their daring nerve and chivalry set Gryffindors apart. Se golden griff, geherm di mit hart skalant in Dresd. Se tellen se hois mit gvira, at azavas gvira heist. You might belong in Hufflepuff, where they are just and loyal. Those patient Hufflepuffs are true and unafraid of toil. Geherst die Widder Hufflepuff, dem Joischer holt die Teier, mats ne stoiste Horvanje, in beständig a getreier. Or yet in wise old Ravenclaw, if you've already mind, where those of wit and learning will always find their kind. Bashert Cezan in Robbenkrell is der mit scharfen Sinnen, die Unhängers von Wissen in fin Klickschaft sich gefinnen. Or perhaps in Slytherin, you'll make your real friends. Those cunning folk use any means to achieve their ends. 
Si efsche treffst die echte Freund in Sander in dem Chitren. Wie er bietem Ziel der Grechen, seinen Kuscher alle Mitteln. So put me on, don't be afraid, don't get in a flap. You're in safe hands, though I have none, for I'm a thinking cap. So Tima Chunit, schreck sich nicht, ich leg auf dir keine Hand, ich bin fort, bloß assortiert hat, gut auf Freund durch Stück gewandt. Fantastic. I, I love the names for hats. I actually got that. <laughs> with, and yeah. In Hebrew, I was stuck with names for hats. And I really, really wanted to use hat terminology and think of, you know, how a hat would talk if a hat were talking. Uh, and I allowed myself to stray a little bit from the original, but I did add, you know, hat hatticisms into the Hebrew. And this is what it sounds like in Hebrew. Uh, and she's called mitznefet amiyun, so feminine form. Okay, hold on. I'm just going to open up to the page. All right. <laughs> Found it? Got it? Sorry, I, I haven't figured out how to share screen, so uh, you'll just have to listen to me. Ani miret k'tzat aluva, ach al tezalzelu bi, ki kol ha'kovayim kulam, bazot lo yitcharu bi. לי אין נוצה או מצחייה ולא פינות שלוש, אך בעניין של למיין, תמיד אני בראש. כי כל אדם אשר יחבוש אותי על הקרקפת, כל מחשבה אצלו בראש, מיד אליי נשקפת. אם אומץ לב ותושייה אמצא אצלו במוח, הודיע חיש את זה האיש לגריפינדור לשלוח. אך אם בגולגלתו אמצא טוב לב, ואורך רוח הודיע כי להפל פף הוא מועמד בטוח. לרייבן קלו אשלח את זה שבראשו חרוט כי תכונותיו המובילות תבונה ולמדנות. אך באשר אמצא עורמה ושאיפה לכוח, אורה מיד את התלמיד לסלידרין לשלוח. על כן חיבשו, אל תחששו, אין חכמה כמותי, ואם חס ושלום אטעה, אני אבלע אותי. So, uh, so the jokes sometimes are are placed a little differently. I mean, I had I had the hat announcing that it will eat itself at the end. If I make a mistake, then I'll eat myself. And I added in the the children's song that I think is originally a German children's song about uh, my hat. It has three corners. I did uh, not know that. Yeah, my hat. It has three corners. Three okay. corners. Has, which is a different tune. Then it's sung in Hebrew, La Kova Sheli, Shalosh Pinot, but it's a children's song that is very, very well known. So rather than have the, the Streimele and the, all the different types of hats that you put in Yiddish, uh, which I found, again, my favorite part, um, I put in a lot of, uh, of, of, you know, references to, I don't have a brim and I don't have a feather and I don't have corners three, but still I'm a great hat, trust me. Uh, yeah, trying to project myself. And this is um, uh, something that Shlonsky, Avraham Shlonsky said about translation. Uh, he said that, well, Shlonsky was, Shlonsky had a Yiddish heart, I think, even though he wrote in Hebrew. Uh, Shlonsky said that, that uh, translators are like actors who are performing the role of the author in a different language and trying to uh, project themselves as though they were the author, uh, which is what I felt that I was doing. Did, do, do you think that you would translate differently a different kind of book? I, I, I mean, with things like wordplay and, and being, you know, and being playful with the language. I think that's something that Rowling does in English. So I allowed myself to do that in Hebrew. And did you feel that as well? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I've done a lot less uh, literary translation than you. Um, so I guess at this point, it's somewhat of a hypothetical. I've done some translation of children's books. And yes, I, I do think that the way that I approach translating um, Harry Potter was very much based on trying to put my to put myself put myself into the text and then letting the Yiddish flow as opposed to sort of you know looking at a sentence and trying to translate it. So I would hope 
um, and expect that that it would come out differently if it were a different book. But I love the metaphor of the actor um, because I think what what Rowling does very interestingly, um, perhaps not uniquely, but certainly interestingly, is that um, there are different there are different layers of of drama, right? So there are certain parts of the narrative which are completely unfunny, you know, perhaps uh, you know serious or, or even scary. Um, and then there are parts which are, as I mentioned before, very self-conscious and ironic and wry. And I felt like that just worked very well with a certain kind of um, tradition of Yiddish narration. Um, and then when it comes to these poems, uh, or, you know, I was uh, I, I was telling you that I, I'd love to share about um, what I did with the Mirror of Erezed, where you have Rowling herself playing with language and doing something wacky. Um, you as the actor, uh, it, it's not just permitted, but I feel like you have to let your own dramatic flair shine, um, which is why, you know, you look at the translations of the Sorting Hat song and they're going to be completely different in every single language because you you just can't do those things word for word. And so you have to, you have to ingest it and then, you know, <laughs> bring it back out in a way that that feels natural to the language, but which feels uh, true to the original. The The poem that is most widely, I think, different in the different translations uh, is in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. There's the Sphinx's Riddle, which is, it's several layers of complication in the translation because it's a poem and it rhymes and uh, and it has, and it's metered, uh, but also it's a riddle and it's a language-based riddle. So any literal translation of that, one example is, uh, tell me what's always the last thing to mend the middle of middle and the end of end. And that's supposed to be the letter D. So a literal translation of that would just fall apart. It would not make any sense. It would not be part of a riddle. And what most of the translators did was write their own riddle in their own language. But you'll see that the length is completely different, that the meters that they chose are different, that, that they're widely, uh, uh, various. And when I meet with children sometimes at schools, I ask them, do you think that this is a particularly bad translation because it's very far away from the original or a good translation? And they're stumped. <laughs> and they're stumped. Um, were you ever stumped? Were there parts that, you know, that you just didn't know what to do for a while? Yeah, I, I think that tends to be uh, how how the things go. I'll kind of initially I'd get stuck on something and I would just stop translating for uh, you know a few days or a week, and I realized that that was completely you know not sustainable. So now when I come across something and I'm like, all right, there's something there. I have no idea what it is. I'm going to come back to you, um, and then you know I'll come back a week later or you know uh, wake up. Uh, you know, in the middle of the night with a brilliant insight, I was like, oh, this is this is what it's got to be. Um, I have to think if there was a particular example of that. Um, I mean, one that I've certainly been spending a lot of time working out is the anagram uh, of, uh, of I am Lord uh, Voldemort. And this one is particularly interesting. Um, I, I'm actually curious to hear um, your thoughts on this, but um, in, in Yiddish, as I, I guess in Hebrew, there are no silent letters exactly for the most part there's no silent letters right and so the t at the end of voldemort it, is it pronounced or is it not well it depends uh you know if you it, it's kind of like a do as i do as i do not as i say because if you ask rolling she will say uh that it is pronounced without the t at the end as as if it were french but then when you hear her in some uh recordings of, of readings she's pronouncing it with the t at the end and so i felt like i had i had to decide in the first book already, um, am I going to do this with the with a tet or not? And uh, I guess I had a lot of luxury here, which you didn't. Which is, I'm starting this once the whole series is out, and so I generally know exactly what's happening, and so I have the ability to plan a lot more in advance, which means I fritter away a lot of my time coming up with translations for things in book six that I really don't need right now. Uh, but it's so much fun, <laughs> uh, you know. And sometimes. Uh... And sometimes, even in the original English, as you said, it's not entirely consistent. 
for instance, the character of, of Nicholas Flamel is pronounced Nicholas Flamel in the first movie, but is based on a real historical character who was French, who called himself Nicolas Flamel, Flamel not Nicholas Flamel. So you'll see in the Fantastic Beasts movie when he comes, he's Nicolas. And in the Harry Potter movies, he's Nicholas. Um, and then there was this whole debate if I made a mistake by translating his name into Nicolas Flamel and not Nicolas Flamel, despite the fact that he's French. Other than that, I was not aware at the time when I translated that he was a real historical character. Uh, even the English is not consistent. So sometimes, you know, I, I allow people in America to call me Gili, even though in Israel they call me Gili. And it's a bit of a difference and Bar Hillel and not Bar Hillel. So I think identities, even of characters, can be fluid in context. Yeah. Um, so again, it, it was a very different world and a very different type of translation that we were doing. Uh, I was translating in a world that had not heard of Harry Potter. Uh, I like telling the story of when I was first approached to translate the, the first book, there was one copy that was circulating in Israel. There were no digital files that could be transferred easily. And while I was waiting for that copy, I went online to look for information about the book. And I didn't Google it because Google was not yet uh, a thing. I searched for it on Alta Vista and on the entire internet, I found six hits for Harry Potter. That's amazing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think the perspective is very different and, uh, and the not knowing ahead what's going to happen and uh, I made mistakes with characters like Blaise Abini, who I assumed was female and later turned out to be male. And that's one of the famous mistakes that's in the books to this day, because we can't change them. Um, did you use any online Harry Potter resources? Were there, were there, were there Harry Potter specific references that were useful to you? Um, I've definitely, uh, referenced the Harry Potter wiki. I think it's like the Harry Potter fandom wiki. Um, because I mean, they're just, they're amazing resources. If I want to say, okay, uh, it, does this thing show, which, which books does this show up in? Do I have to deal with this? Um, can I translate this spell this way? Because what are the spells that I'm going to have to translate? Um, and am I going to accidentally use up, you know, the, the, the translation that really should go on the other one for this one. And so I, I've, I've definitely taken advantage of those resources. And there are certain cases where I've kind of settled on the translation that I'm going to do. And then I will check. Um, there is like a, there, I think there's a wiki, uh, Wikipedia page on um, terms translated in Harry Potter into different languages, just to make sure that I am not completely out in left field. Um, and I think there have been a lot of cases, uh, not a lot of cases, um, a couple of cases where I did something and then I saw that nobody else was doing it and it didn't, I, I didn't feel that invested in it. And I was like, okay, it'd be a little bit chutzpah to, to do this. So, you know, I, I don't need to be the special person who did this. Uh, I have plenty of other special things. <laughs> Uh, one thing that I meant to ask at the very, very beginning, uh, how did it come about that the book was published in Sweden, of all places? Yeah, uh, this is a great time for me to be answering this question because I'm actually uh, leaving in four days uh, for Sweden uh, for the weekend. I'm going to be leading a translation seminar there. Um, the short of the story, Kitzer, is that um, in the early 90s, I think maybe 1993, um, the Swedish government implemented a law that um, stipulated that certain minority languages that um, had been spoken in the country for, I think it was like a, a minimum of, of 50 years so far, and also by a, that had a certain minimum population as of like 1970 or something, um, would be granted official minority status, which unfortunately doesn't mean huge sums of money, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, at least they haven't come to me. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but uh, it, it does mean that you can uh, request 
uh, you can request government uh, documents in Yiddish. So there is uh, documents on dental health and sexual education in Yiddish um, coming out of the Swedish government. You can request court translation. Um, and I, I do think there are there are some number of uh, of grants. And of course, there is um, there is a Yiddish community there. There was a huge number of um, immigrants to Sweden, especially um, Polish Yiddish speaking Jews um, uh, dur during the war and and after the war. And so um, actually, my my uncle uh, grew up, uh, spent his teenage years in. I, I have I have a second cousin who lives in Sweden to this day. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. So Absolutely. it's um yeah that that is why there is so much uh, Yiddish culture in Sweden, and it's you know it's funny to think that a uh, you know a a guy from New Jersey with an Indian name who grew up speaking Yiddish uh, published uh, Harry Potter in Yiddish through a, a Swedish. Uh, uh, Swedish publishing house, the head of which is uh, in a metal band. Uh, so there's, uh, yes, he, he, he's in a Yiddish metal band as well. So there's a lot a of- Yiddish metal band. Yiddish it's metal, yes. I think he's done some other metal too. I, it's hard to imagine that somebody comes to Yiddish metal out of the blue. Uh, <laughs> no, no, this is amazing. I now need to look up Yiddish, this Yiddish metal band. That's absolutely fantastic. And I wish, you know, I wish here in Israel we were the supportive. There is a Yiddish bill theater. I have a friend who's an actor in Yiddish Bill Theater, and he, I think by now, speaks Yiddish a little bit, but he started just by learning the Yiddish by rote, the sounds, without knowing any Yiddish at all. And I think quite a few of the Yiddish Bill actors are like that. So I don't know of secular Yiddish-speaking communities here that, that I would connect to, but I do know a lot of people who thought the Yiddish Harry Potter translation was fantastically cool. Um, and, you know, and we're kind of excited and kind of, you know, oh my goodness, finally get to be a Harry Potter in Yiddish, even though it's, you know, it's not necessarily a language that they read or understand. I love uh, that there are people who bought the book just to have it on their bookshelves. I mean, that's, you know, that's uh, whoever, who, who the famous person who said, you know, show me your bookshelf and and I'll tell you who you are. I, I think that people do feel like there's a value, even if they won't be able to. Uh, to Absolutely, read it. I know. I know many people here, including my wonderful sister-in-law, who got two copies: one for herself and one for me. So I also have a copy of your translation. Uh, so there are there are many people who who I think, uh, you know, but going back to calling Yiddish mama lotion, even people who don't speak Yiddish at home there's this nostalgic connection to the language. There's this, uh, a, a deep feeling of, you know, this is our heritage and this is where we come from and this is very much ours and connecting two loves, connecting the new love for the Harry Potter books and, and the old love for, for family and tradition and, and, you know, and grandma's cooking and Bobby's cooking uh, nice. kind of connects in this book. And so thank know, you for, for as we know that. from Harry Potter's survival story, love is a very powerful, uh, powerful force. So thank That's you so much as well. Uh, and I think we have some time for for questions. If there are you know places that we should have gone to in the conversation and we haven't gone gotten yet, uh, let's see. I have uh, a a question from Ari Adler for for own and future tense for Gili and past tense. Do you, did you think about cultural equivalence for some of the ma fantasy and magic terms? For example, names of mythical creatures translated as mythical creatures from Yiddish or Hebrew folklore. So that one, how about you start? Were there yeah. cultural equivalents for fantasy and magic terms other than Quidditch, which you've already gave the example? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think it kind of goes back to what you were saying about you had some people feeling like you had abraicized way too much. And especially for me, it was translating for an audience that already knew Harry Potter in English. They didn't want, or this was my perception, they don't want some completely new universe. They want the Harry Potter that they love, but they want it in Yiddish. And so I had to be very careful. Um, but I will mention that I spent a lot of time uh, digging into Yiddish folklore. And there is this amazing legend, which you see from uh, towns across all of Eastern Europe. Um, of this little creature, which 
uh, sneaks into your workshop at night and takes all of your raw materials. And, and in the morning you wake up and it's a finished product. And in every single one of these stories, what happens is that the, uh, the, um, the Bal uh, you know, the, the artisan's wife says, oh, poor little guy, he doesn't have any clothes. Let's give him some clothes. And he shows up, he gets clothes. He says, oh, I'm out of here. And it's amazing how you see these kinds of parallels um, across cultures. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, I had to be very, very careful about not, you know, just um, shoehorning uh, the Harry Potter stuff into Yiddish folklore. So I, I tried to do it in a way which was respectful of both and which maintained the recognizability of the original. Um, so yeah, there are certainly some cases where I had the opportunity to, but I generally try to keep most of the things um, as they are. Well, with some terms, there simply is a tradition in Hebrew for the terms. And I think the most, the, the big example of that is the title of the book. Harry Potter ve'even ha'chachamim. I've had people say, how did philosophers turn into chachamim? Or the American version, they didn't keep it the philosopher's stone. In the American edition, they changed it from philosopher's stone to sorcerer's stone, which really is going against history because the philosopher's stone is a real historic, well, is it <laughs> historic real. artifact, whether it's real or not. It ha has a long history, and Nicolas Flamel, Nicolas Flamel, was a real alchemist living in Paris, and you can visit his house, and he really did claim to have discovered the uh, the uh, the philosopher's stone. And I was contacted by someone from the National Library. We're closing all these circles now. Who said, "Do you know that one of the 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 oldest texts we have right now in the National Library?" is a Hebrew version of the story of Nicolas Flamel, who was approached by a stranger who brought him pages from a book in Hebrew, telling him how to manufacture the Philosopher's Stone. And Nicolas Flamel learned Hebrew so that he would be able to decipher these pages. This is a historical anecdote. <laughs> That's going amazing. back way, way, way before, you know, hundreds of years. So I had to translate Evan Achachamim. I couldn't yeah. do it, even a philosophim or even a kosmim. That's the name in Hebrew. Phoenix has a name in Hebrew. Yes, exactly. Other creatures don't don't have don't necessarily have names in Hebrew. So it depended on you know whether they had a rich tradition or not. Some creatures have a tradition that's a Celtic British tradition. Some of the creatures were completely invented by Rowling, and then I had you know I. I went all over. I had fun with the names. Okay, another question. Um, let's try someone else. Uh, from Harrison, I'm one of the two people working on a project, the book that lives.com. We're working on collecting recordings of the first paragraph of the first book in all different languages. Arun was very willing to donate to donate his voice at the project, was wondering how I could reach out to the hip. Sure. I'd be glad to do that. That's an easy question to answer. Um, uh, you can uh, contact me either through the National Library and they'll give me your email or I have your uh, website details, or you can contact me through the website for Oots Publishing, my publishing house, utz.co.il um, is the website. and anything there reaches me. Um, Ronnie, another easy one, Ronnie Mandowski, will, will additional Harry books be translated into Yiddish? Um, I'm working on the second one. Uh, I, I, I have a two-year-old now, which I know is no excuse because, you know, uh, that didn't slow you down. Oh, it's an excuse for everything. You have a two-year-old, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm, the I'm fact that you're enough. functioning is uh, incredible. Good for you. I'm almost done with the second book, and I, I hope that it will be ready for Hanukkah next year, which uh, leads me to just uh, plug one more time before people start dropping off, that if you order today, it should arrive in time for Hanukkah. It's $28. Uh, that includes free international shipping. Um, so do click on the link um, and uh, order it for yourself to uh, be able to brag about your bookshelf. I'll also bookshelf. say that it's one of the, the one of the prettier editions. Do you know who, who did the illustrations? 
Um, uh, the illustrations themselves, the artwork is done by Johnny Duddle. Um, and we, we had somebody, uh, uh, of course, do the, do the Yiddish lettering, which is beautiful as well. But so it's, it's a particularly handsome looking book as well. So I can recommend it as a, as a Hanukkah gift, as a, you know, Christmas gift. Um, uh, there's a question here. What did you do in Yiddish with the Christmas song? Uh, Not <laughs> God rest Merry gentlemen. Well, that, that's, that, that only comes up in one of the later books. So Owen will have to solve that when it comes around. Yes, uh, yes. But yeah, but uh, the, I think the first book is less problematic Christmas wise. Was there anything I mean, there? There's plenty of references to Christmas, but uh, I mean, probably many people know that Nittel is, is the Yiddish word for Christmas. It's, it's not like Yiddish is uh, completely unfamiliar with Christianity, given that it was embedded within it for 500 years. So uh, <laughs> the words are there. Uh, I was wondering why Gilly said she couldn't change Blaze from girl to a boy. I can't go back and, you know, change books that have already been printed. And uh, people say, so you couldn't do it in the next uh, edition. Uh, it doesn't, I, you know, I'll, it's a whole different lecture of how publishing works. But I, once I submitted my translation, I'm not privy to the decisions of when to reprint and when to make changes. All this is done by people I've never met. Uh, without consulting with me. So I have no idea when the next edition will be printed. Uh, I have no input unless they ask me and, you know, I can't wave my magic wand and change uh, uh, really uh, tens of thousands of books that have already been printed uh, and are already in circulation. Even if we changed it now, the book has been in print for over 20 years. Uh, so that's what I can't change. I apologize for not being, you know, not having a okay here's the question uh the hindi translation chose to use sanskrit instead of affected latin for the language of spells did either of you consider at one point using another language such as aramaic for the language of the spells uh okay <laughs> well, okay this kind of goes uh to an example that i thought might be fun to share um so maybe i'll do that very quickly um in short um, I did not think about changing any of the spells that were in pseudo Latin because um, Yiddish, as a as a uh, European language, uh, developed a sort of uh, Latinate superstratum, just like many other languages. And you have many, you know, uh, international uh, words in Hebrew as well. Um, and so it felt entirely natural to have Vingardium Leviosa. Um, but there are certain spells which I am definitely planning to translate differently. For example, the spell ridiculous to banish a boggart. Obviously, you know, that is going to have, you know, it's based on the English. And so there's there's something to do with it. So I didn't want to turn it in, into Aramaic. Um, Gil, you, if you want to share yours while I pull up my screen. Well, you know, first of all, there were so many uh, words that I had to consider. Uh, I mean, I, we filled, uh, I think it was 17 pages just with lists of terms and names so I could keep them all straight in a document that we called the Diction Harry uh, so that I wouldn't, uh, you know, accidentally retranslate something differently than I had done the first time, which happened a couple of times, by the way, uh, working over years with you know, it's a stack of books. I don't even know how many words are in all the books put together, but it, this is uh, eight years of work, lots of different people, a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. So I made, I had to make decisions. And sometimes the decision was uh, not to start going down another rabbit hole. Uh, rabbit you know, hole. In, in order to translate into Aramaic, I would have had to start consulting with people who know Aramaic, which I do not, and trying to do that cleverly. And I might have been setting myself up for something going wrong later when suddenly the word uh, we find out has another meaning on top of the meaning that was used, which happened a lot because I was translating the books as they were being written. Um, there is, a, you know, the, the one place where I have it, did we, there's a screen for a moment, sorry. The one place was with, with Avada Kedavra, uh, which, which, you know, that comes from Aramaic originally. So, so it become, became, Avda Kedabra. Again, because she didn't do abracadabra, she changed it into Avada Kedabra to stick in the English word cadaver, uh, death, death, right? 
So avda uh, kedabra in in Hebrew uh, has a sort of Aramaic structure, but one of the reasons is because the English word is based on a word that came from Aramaic, um, abracadabra. Um, I think uh, one more question from Cornelia. Hi, Cornelia. Cornelia, Cornelia was uh, a guest at the Harry Potter Translators Convention in Paris in, I think it was uh, 2007, uh, where uh, a dozen Harry Potter translators from all over the world uh, met up, uh, invited by the Japanese translator, uh, and uh, and Cornelia was also there, my friend. Arun, you already mentioned the Voldemort anagram, which became important in volume two. Any <laughs> other translation seed for the future that you're particularly excited about? So one uh, would definitely be Sirius Black. Um, and it, some people criticized and said, why didn't you change it to Sirius Schwartz? First of all, Sirius, Schwartz, Sirius Black is not a Jew. Um, second of all, um, I felt like by keeping keeping that as black, I could keep words like Schwartz and Finstead and other words related to darkness for a bunch of puns. Um, for example, in Hebrew, you say uh, something like that, um, uh, meaning, you know, it was... Uh, I, I, I saw this thing and I was horrified. Um, and I can just imagine, uh, for example, when um, when uh, Sirius's mother in the tapestry is talking about how he's completely messed up their yiches. So I feel like there's some really fun things there, but um, I'm, I don't even know if I'm going to get that far. Uh, it, it really depends on whether I want to do anything else with my life. Uh, so we will have to see. <laughs> we we start in a pun on, on black actually when, when we, uh, we I, I don't even remember the exact context, but in one of the later books where the the house is a big mess and they're saying how it's getting blacker and blacker, and we said something about buka um vulaka to have the this the black in there. Uh, um, Another thing I just remembered, uh, speaking of, you know, Hebrew and Jewish tradition, Jewish superstitions, uh, one of the, I'm sometimes questioned why I turned uh, Hedwig from an owl into a, a tinshemit, which is a barn owl, from a snowy owl to a barn owl. I made her a white barn owl rather than a snowy owl. Uh, and that's one of the rare examples where there are more words in Hebrew for different types of owl than in English. Usually it's the other way around. In English, you have barn owls, you have eagle owls, you have pygmy owls, you have all sorts of owls. In Hebrew, every one of them is considered a different bird. You have an och, you have a kos, you have a ketofa, and the Snowy Owl is Lilit Hashelig, which is confusing for two reasons. One of which is that it's not very commonly known. If I had written that he has a Lilit, I don't think most readers would know that without actually going and looking it up. Um, unlike Tinshemit, which is well known. Uh, or Yan Shufa, I just didn't like it because it's not a feminine form. Uh, Tinshemit is feminine to begin with. And the other is because I'd already used Lilith for Banshee, for a type of um. demon. Later, I also put in Banshee. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Lilith is a demon. And, it, and in Harry Potter, where you have actual demons, yeah. it can get confusing if you mean owl or demon. So yeah, so there are complications in the translation. Um, I think we'll let it be one last question uh, from Carlo Meloni to Arun. Are there many Yiddish translations of modern books? If I'm not wrong, somebody has already translated Tolkien's books, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Is this something that is becoming more widespread recently? Well, what's amazing is that uh, at the turn of the 
the turn of the 19th century, there was a tremendous amount of translation into Yiddish of world literature that was happening as the, uh, the Eastern U European Jewish population was rapidly urbanizing and becoming educated, but, uh, but didn't speak all of these world, world languages. And so Yiddish was the vehicle to make accessible world literature. And today, what we're seeing in many ways is kind of the opposite. It's the use of world literature, or perhaps niche, <laughs> niche world literature, um, to make Yiddish accessible or to engage with Yiddish in a creative way. Um, so I would say that there are, there's certainly, um, you know, the, the Yiddish's world is not enormous. Um, you know, Gilly, you said that you're not uh, familiar of any uh, sort of like big communities. The Yiddish's community is- in Secular and, communities. Secular, yes. Um, but for a long time, the Yiddish's community has been decentralized. And um, that is, in, in that sense, it makes, it, it's very, global and you know you no, no matter where you travel there's always a yiddishist uh who will uh, who will uh, warmly greet you um but yeah so there are uh some people doing translation um i know of somebody who's currently translating uh 1984 into yiddish um, and i'm really excited about that so i would say maybe there's five or 10 people um, who are doing, doing Yiddish translation, but because this is not the sort of thing uh, which is like a lucrative market, uh, I only recently uh, broke even in terms of my my investments uh, monetarily, not to mention my my time. Um, it's something that you really have to be you know invested in and excited. This is not my day job. Uh, I, I do something else. Um, so you know <laughs> we, we, we find time to do this in our free time because we're excited to engage with Yiddish as well. You know, by the time your daughter is old enough to read, maybe there'll be a nice shelf full of books. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. God willing. So I, it was an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Uh, I, I I admire your spirit and your sense of humor. I think I think you're. You know, I don't read Yiddish, but it feels like you were the right choice for the job. You you definitely have uh, the sense of humor required. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wish you much, much luck uh, with book two and may it be, you know, a huge success so that there's no question if you continue or not. Um, I'd be uh, overjoyed to meet you in person someday at a huge uh, Harry Potter translators convention or uh, something like that. Oh, man. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you to the audience. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much on behalf of the audience and the National Library. Thank you very much, Arun and Gili, for this really fascinating discussion, and we wish you a lot of luck. There is also one important comment um, in the chat that uh, maybe uh, an audiobook would be a, a great idea for uh, Harry Potter in Yiddish. So I hope. Maybe we can ask Swedish government um, to also sponsor this kind of uh, item. Thank you very much to all of you, Aaron Gilly, once again, and all of the audience. Have a great evening here in Israel and great afternoon if you are in the East Coast or somewhere else. Thank you very much.